tonight at our Bible study here uh, this morning. Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 12, the second book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Exodus and chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Here this morning, I'm going to continue dealing with the blood of Jesus Christ, but we're reading from the Old Testament. And over the past recent weeks, I've been preaching on Sunday mornings about what the Bible says about the blood of Jesus Christ, what the apostles taught about the blood, that it is the only means of salvation, that apart from the blood, you are in serious trouble. That's what the Bible teaches. And unless you know that, you know nothing about the Bible or what Jesus done on the cross, or what the apostles taught. That is the central message. And although this is a special service this morning to dedicate a baby to the Lord, a child to the Lord, I do have a special message from the Bible on this subject. My message this morning is a lamb for a house. A lamb for a house. Reading from Exodus chapter 12. And verse 1, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. And it says there, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month of this month, Sorry, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let them and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eaten shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs and shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden with water, but roast with fire, his head and his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And this is the reason why they did it. For I, that is God, will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, Will I execute judgment? I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Let's pray together. Father, I do thank you this morning for the word of God and the blood of Jesus, for what Jesus done in dying upon the cross. Father, we do thank you for this this baby dedication this morning. We thank you for Sophia Faith. We thank you, O God, for bringing her into this family and even into the midst of this church where she'll grow up to hear about what Christ has done for her, that God so loved her, that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Lord God, I do pray, O God, let your hand be upon this family today. I pray for this entire family circle, both sides of the family, that you meet that you, you, you meet with every single one of them. Lord God, you know their hearts, you know their thoughts, you know their troubles, you know their trials, you know their sins, you know their struggles, you know their fears, you know their unbeliefs, oh God. And Father, I pray that you make Jesus Christ the Lamb of God, the answer to every situation in their life, that you'd set them free 
from their sin and their trials and their troubles, nor God, that you'd show them that there's a satisfying, uh, deep relationship with Jesus Christ that they can enjoy. Lord God, I do pray for your blessing on this family, and I do thank you for bringing the truth of Jesus into the midst of this family in these days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. My message here, a lamb for a house. That may seem like a strange title, and yet I'm quoting the Bible. It says here in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3, a lamb for a house. And I want to explain to you what that means here this morning in this message. As we come to dedicate a young child, a baby, to the Lord, asking him to look after her life. My message, a lamb for a house. What does it mean? The verses we read, you might sit here this morning and say, what are you talking about? Everything you're talking about is like another language. The words you're using, the text you're reading, it doesn't make any sense to me. Surely, what are you going to preach out of that this morning from Exodus chapter 12? Well, let me show you. I'm preaching here about the blood, lambs, houses, being in Egypt. And you'll say, what does it all mean? Let me tell you what it means. Over in the New Testament, just before Jesus began preaching, listen to what happened in John chapter 1 and verse 29. A strange prophet from God appeared suddenly out of the wilderness in the land of Israel, at the river Jordan and began to preach, repent, repent from your sins. He was a strange man. He dressed strangely. He ate strangely. He preached strangely. And he didn't preach in the synagogue. He didn't preach in the temple or the city. He went and preached on an old dirty river at the outskirts of the nation. He stood on the river banks of a river called Jordan. And he called men, repent to your sin. There's a day of judgment coming. Flee from the wrath to come. All of your sins, one day, you're going to be held accountable for. That man of God dealt with every single heart. He dealt with the religious. Most of the religious, he said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're a bunch of serpents. He wasn't a nice, mild preacher like me. He was a rough man who spoke the truth from God. He called a spade a spade, and he didn't compromise his language. He says, your sin will damn you in hell forever. But listen to a strange thing that he said in John chapter 129. Listen carefully. As Jesus suddenly appeared the first time at the banks of the Jordan, John pointed at Jesus Christ, who was his cousin. And he said this, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Do you know what he was saying? That was a strange message here in Israel. You see, they believed in killing lambs. They believed you had to kill a lamb and shed its blood to cover your sin and to be saved from the wrath of God. That was the only way your sin could be covered. Here's John the Baptist pointing out a man who's 30 years old, a man who's his cousin by birth, a man who's lived in Nazareth all his days. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God. He calls Jesus Christ the Lamb of God. That's the name he gives to him. Never has a man been called the Lamb of God. This title was only given to Jesus Christ. And look what he says. This man is going to be the Lamb of God. God has given Jesus to be the Lamb of God. And this man, when he dies and his blood is shed, he's going to take away the sin of the world. That literally means to carry it away or to remove the sin from where it is and to place it in a different place. When Jesus Christ dies, he is going to bear the sin of the world. If good deeds could get you to heaven, Jesus would never have died. If religion and church attendance could save you and make you good and ready for heaven, Jesus would never have died. He would have told you, just be good. And yet the Bible says, none is good. None is righteous. Your works cannot save you. You can only be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. This strange preacher, prophet, said this man is going to be the Lamb of God. This man is going to be 
the lamb that's slain to take away your sin. Do you realize in the Bible for 4,000 years of history and of 2,000 years of, of Jewish Israeli history that you had to have a lamb slain for your sin? In other words, when John appeared on the banks of the Jordan, he said, the entire Bible, I'm summarizing it in one man. For 4,000 years, God has been teaching people that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, there's no freedom, there's no relationship with God, unless it's through blood. You can't approach God by being religious. Sure, your humility is stinking with pride. Have you ever met someone who's proud of their humility and they want to communicate to you? Do you realize how humble I am? Do you realize how much I love everybody by doing my social deeds? It stinks in the nostrils of God. There's lots of people out there who are very social and they'll give money to the poor or they'll try to feed someone and yet their attitudes are stinking to hell. I mean they're covetous, they're proud, they're arrogant, they're manipulators. They're liars, but they give a bit of money to the poor and say, aren't I a religious person? No, you're depraved, you're rotten, you're stinking. I'm just telling you what John the Baptist preached here. He looked at Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God. Do you know a few verses later, he's not only preaching this, but he's standing talking with some of his disciples. And he actually looks at Jesus and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And listen, there were two disciples standing beside him. And he said this to them. And he said, look, that man is the Lamb of God. And it says that those two disciples followed Jesus from that day. They went and followed him. Do you know who they were? One of them was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. You know, Simon Peter, the great preacher, he's a fisherman at this point. But Andrew, his brother says Jesus is the Lamb of God. It's not going to be by sacrifice or ritual or the temple or the priesthood or the high priest. It's going to be through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And from that day, Andrew said, I'm following Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He is the answer. Do you know in the New Testament, we read about Jesus being the Lamb of God. If you go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the apostle John, just a young man, he, he writes in there in Revelation 13 and 8, he says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, talking about Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, 32 times Jesus is called the lamb of God. 28 of those times is in the book of Revelation. In other words, Revelation is all about the Lamb of God, not Antichrist, not tribulation, not judgment. It's about the Lamb of God. This young man, John, who was the youngest of the disciples, he kept calling Jesus the Lamb of God. He talks about that when they sing in heaven, they sing to the Lamb of God. He says when Jesus comes again, and he is coming back again, but he's coming back as the lamb with wrath to judge the world. You know what John says about him? When he comes back, he'll come back as the lamb of God. In other words, the entire Bible speaks about Jesus being the lamb of God. And yet, when you start a Genesis and go through, for 4,000 years, it was always the shedding of the blood. You said, what's that got to do with your text? It's got everything to do with it this morning. Let's go here to Exodus chapter 12 for a moment. And I've got four points for you here. Do you realize that Paul the Apostle in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, he talks about Christ being the Passover that is sacrificed for us. What does Paul mean? He looks at Jesus and he said, Jesus is the Passover who has died or been sacrificed for us. What does he mean then? Do you know what Paul is talking about? Is Exodus 12 where I have read. You can't understand what Paul means or Peter or John or any of them unless you understand Exodus chapter 12. When Paul says Christ is the Passover, he's saying he is the Passover lamb talked about in Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, twice the Bible speaks and says, about the Lord's Passover in verse 11 and again in verse 27. This lamb in Exodus 12 is called the Lord's Passover. 
because of what the Lord is going to do. What does all this mean, the Passover? Let me explain. In Exodus 12, they were going to keep the very first Passover meal. A lamb was going to be shed. It was going to die for the sin of the entire nation for every one of them. If the lamb didn't die, they would die. They would suffer for their sin. They would be judged. God wouldn't show them any love or mercy. It was going to be by a lamb that an entire nation gets delivered from Egypt. Do you know the entire Jewish nation of Israel was captives in Israel? And there was about two million of them, they're slaves. And life had become very hard. And Pharaoh had risen up and he was trying to make their life as hard as possible. And yet they were having their children and growing as a nation. And God says, I'm going to deliver you. I will destroy Egypt. So he sent nine plagues and he shook the nation. And yet Pharaoh hardened his heart. And he said, I'm going to send one last plague, just one last plague. And you know what? I'm going to smite the children in every single home and they're going to die. And then Egypt will let go. And you know what? You Jews better realize if you don't slay a lamb, your children will die like everyone else. Don't think that you're any different than anyone else. Any better that you're a Jew and they're Egyptians. You know what? There's a day coming where death is going to visit every home in this room. Every family in this room, every person in this room, do you realize that is a certain thing? That is a set thing. It is a serious thing. But I have a message for you, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, at the Passover, the first, Moses said, God has told me that on this date, on this night, we're to keep the lamb. We're to slay the lamb and to eat it roast with bread. And we're there to gather and you know what? That night we're going to get delivered from the nation. When God actually came to a time where he was going to rescue Israel from Egypt to deliver his people from 400 years of bondage, he put, and listen this carefully, he put a lamb in every home. My message here this morning is a lamb for a house. What did God do when he was going to deliver an entire nation and save every individual of, that was God's people? He put a lamb in every single house. He put a lamb in that home and he showed them that it was only by the blood. My first point, only one lamb, only one lamb. Let me give you four points here from Exodus 12 that point to Jesus. What is this lamb? It's Jesus Christ. It's pointing forward. All the shadows, all the prophecies were about Jesus. My first point, only one lamb. In verse 3 here it says, And they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. There's two million people, Jews, in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen in Egypt. Two million Jews. Think about this. And yet in this entire chapter, we only read of one singular lamb in the whole thing. They're actually told that every man of every home over every family is to go and take a lamb and to bring it into his home. Do you realize there would have been, about, if there was about 10 people in each house or each home, that means there was 200,000 lambs slain that night to cover all of the families in the nation. They didn't do this in the synagogue or in a temple or jointly together. They had to take it right into their homes. The lamb had to be in the home right in the midst of that family with the father and the mother and the children and the aunts and the uncles and the granny and granddad and all of the others and they had to gather in. If 10 people gathered in each home, there would have been 200,000 lambs died in that one night. In that one night. And yet in this entire chapter, it only talks about one lamb. It never talks about lambs. It never talks about many. Listen to what it says. In verse 3, it talks about a lamb. In verse 4, the lamb. In verse 5, your lamb. 
In other words, this was very personal. There is only one lamb. Do you know there's a prophecy about Jesus? There's not many lambs. There's not many Jesus. There's only one lamb, only one Jesus, only one lamb of God. And this is a prophecy saying anyone who gets forgiveness is going to meet the same lamb. There's going to be an experience. Do you know what they done? They would choose the lamb on the 10th day of the month. They separated it from all the goats and all the other sheep. And they actually brought it into their home. And for the next three to four days, they inspected it. You know why? It's to have no blemishes, no broken bones, no blind eyes, no legs that didn't know how to work. And you know what? For four days, they're studying this little lamb in their house. You know what? That lamb is going to die for your sin. It better be perfect. You, You better not make uh, shortcuts here you better not play with your eternal soul you better not say well sure i'm just hoping i'll be fine and sure i'm religious sure i know there's something you better not play with your soul if the if your lamb does not save you you're in serious trouble on that night when god comes to judge every man and woman on the on the night when death comes to your home, you're in serious trouble if your lamb isn't able to work for you. You better make sure your lamb, your Jesus, is the real Jesus. You know, over in the New Testament, we read about Pilate taking Jesus into his judgment hall, and he quizzed him, and he questioned him, and he judged him. Listen to what he said. He was the highest authority. He said, I find no fault with him. He's a lamb without bellet blemish he's not guilty he's holy he is pure he is absolutely spotless this little lamb was to have no broken bones and only Jews were to sit and partake of it it was a lamb for an entire household a family listen to me here and Ian and Eve especially there is a lamb for your household there is only one lamb can save your household and your children God has given you children religion won't save them Church won't save them. Preachers won't save them. None of that will save them. You know the only thing that will save them is the Lamb of God. Why did John Baptist say, behold the Lamb of God. Look at him. Behold him. Stop what you're doing. Religion doesn't save. Churchianity doesn't save. Good intentions don't save. Only the Lamb of God. What's my message? There is only one Lamb of God. What does the Bible say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only, look at that word only. There's only one lamb. There's only one son of God. And you know what he said? He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross that whosoever believeth in him, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Do you realize it depends on what you do with the only son of God, the lamb of God. What you do with him will either send you to hell eternally or send you into heaven when you die. What you do with the lamb of God. You see, there's only one Lamb of God, not 200,000. There's not 10 different Gospels. There isn't 100 different types of church. There's only one Gospel, and you read about it in the New Testament. What what does Peter uh, preach in Acts 4 and 12? He says, neither is there salvation in any other. No other religion will save you. No other types of Christianity or cults or ideas or someone saying, I think. I think, there, it's laid down here, it's as clear as day. It is in black and white. Every man of God has preached this through the years. There's only one Lamb of God, only one way of salvation, only one way to be right with God. And you better make sure that Lamb is in your home. This Lamb of God, this real Lamb of God, make sure he's in your home. Secondly, only by the blood. Only one Lamb, only by the blood. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I don't like all this blood stuff. Then you're in trouble. Then you're in trouble. Oh, come on, brother, Uh, uh, Keith. You you know, it's gory. It is. It is. And you know what? He had to die on the cross because of your sin. You don't like the thought of blood. What about your sin? There's men and women who love their sin. They enjoy their sin. They're not going to let go of their sin. They go, I love my sin. I revel in my sin. And yet they look at Jesus and go, that's horrible. Yes, and it was your sin. Your sin put him there. Only by the blood. In 
Verse 6 here in our chapter, it says, The congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Do you realize on that night, when the angel of death was going to come through, they had to kill the lamb. They had to kill the lamb. You know what? They're involved with this. I'm involved with his death on the cross. You know what? It was my sin put him on the cross. It was your sin. You say, oh, I'm I'm too nice and clean for that. You're not. Your sin is real. Your sin is real. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. Look what they've done in verse 7. And they shall take of the blood. Now notice this is a picture about Jesus is the Passover. Jesus is the Lamb of God. What they do here in chapter 12 is a picture of what we are to do to be saved. What do they do? They kill the lamb in their home for their family, for their house. And then it says they take the blood and they had to strike it on the door frame of the door. They went out and they'd done it on the lintels of the door, above the door and on the sides of the door. And they had a basin filled with the blood of the lamb. You see... Jesus in himself does not save you. It's his blood. What does the New Testament say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Do you realize any religious act you've ever done in your life that you've been told that will forgive your sins is an absolute lie. The apostles say without the shedding of blood... Unless you put faith in the blood, you're still in your sin. Your good deeds can't wash away your sin. Even if you could be perfect from today on, what about your past sins? And what about if you just sin once? You know, some of you, as you go to bed at night, and you wake up feeling lousy in the morning. What happened during the night? What happened during the night? I'm telling you here, only by the blood. This chapter tells us that it's the blood that saves you. They had to take the blood with hyssop, and they sprinkled it on the doorposts of the house. And you know what God says? I will see the blood. When I pass over the land, and I'm looking for the blood, if I don't see blood, there, there's going to be death in your house. The, the oldest child is going to die in one night. I don't care if you're Jewish. I don't care if you're religious. I don't care what you believe. If I don't see blood on your house, you will die in that night. You know what the whole New Testament says? On that day when you come to die, if God cannot see the blood in your life, you will drop into an eternal hell. I'm just telling you what the Bible says here. It is such a, a real thing. Only by the blood. There's no salvation apart from the blood. And do you know what they had to do? Stand at the door, take the hyssop, and they had to sprinkle. What does the hyssop represent? Faith. How do I get the blood into my life? How do I get my sins forgiven and washed away? How do I have my, the Lamb of God applied to me? Some people say, I believe in Jesus. Are you washed in the blood? Oh, oh, I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he was good. I believe he's God's son. Has the blood touched your life or affected you or washed away your sin? Or are you still carrying your sin? It's one or the other. You see, they took the blood for the home, for the family. Can I encourage you all as a family? The blood of Jesus is powerful for your family. There were little children in that home. They didn't know anything that was happening. They didn't understand it. And yet the father of that home had to go to the door and say, I want my entire family to be under the blood. I want all of them to trust in the blood. I want all of them to be saved by the blood. And you know what? There was little children in there knew nothing. They didn't understand it. You know, as a young boy, I grew up in a home where I had a mother who every single morning should pray with me before I went to school, all through primary school and all through high school. And before I went out that door, said, son, let's pray together. We'd read the Bible and then we'd pray. And she always prayed about the blood. She would say, Lord, let the covering of the blood be on our home, upon our, uh, upon our families and my children and protect them and guard them. Do you know when she started doing that? Many years before, her and her husband, my dad, walked into a meeting. And they're a young Christian couple with two kids. 
And the preacher started preaching from Exodus chapter 12 on exactly what I'm saying here. And he says, every day plead the blood over your entire family, over your children. There is a blood covering as taught here. And you know, my mom and dad walked out of the meeting that night and they went home and as they're driving, they talked together and said, you know what? Every day we're going to pray for our family. Oh, the blood, that's going to be our promise, our hope for our entire family. We want to make the blood our salvation. So they start doing it that next morning. The first time they ever as a couple pleaded the blood and said the blood is the basis of salvation in this home. Do you know what happened later that day? I had two brothers and in Bambridge, my mom actually looked after a little Christian bookshop and my brother Ian was up playing on a wall. And my mom come out of the shop to tell him to get off. You know why? See on that wall was a sheer drop. I mean about 15 feet down. A sheer drop. And underneath there is all these boulders and rocks everywhere. All, all through there. And he was playing on that little ledge of a wall. And my mom come out of the shop. She'd seen him through the window. And she's about to shout at him. When this little girl who's playing with him. Goes up to him and shoves him off the wall. And he falls over. All my mom can see him is going over. She knows what's at the other side. And she ran with all of her might to that wall. And she looked over the wall and looked down. And you know what? There is rocks everywhere. And there's one small area filled with nettles. And he fell right on the nettles. And all around him, a foot either direction. And he would have been literally broken up. He would have died that day. There's no doubt about that. And he was stung from head to toe with nettles. But you know what? As soon as my mom looked over that wall with all that fear welling up and she knew we pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ. I prayed for protection of my children here this morning. Since we're not playing in our homes and families, this is an evil world. It's a wicked world. You better want the Lamb of God in that home. You want the blood of Jesus. You know what? This is the answer answer for your children. There's sexual immorality, drugs, suicide filling this city. It's going to come knocking on the door of every young child. I wish it wasn't that way. You know, if I had a little girl, a little daughter, I wouldn't want to tell her there's men you shouldn't get in their car in this city. I, I, I wouldn't want to tell her, but I've got to warn her. At a young age, I'm going to say, don't you take sweeties from anyone. Don't you get in a car with anyone. Don't you go uh, with any stranger. I don't want to tell. I don't want to explain. But I've got to protect that little child. Do you realize what's waiting to hit the children of this generation? I wish it wasn't, but we can't pretend. But I have an answer. I have a Lamb of God. I have the blood of Jesus Christ. There is an answer. Thirdly, only one family of God. You hear people in this city say, oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. The Bible doesn't teach that. Nowhere does it teach that. In fact, Jesus said many times to the religious who said, we're keeping the Bible. We're doing good deeds. We're keeping the commandments. We go to the synagogue. You know what Jesus said? You're of your father, the devil. And they said, how dare you? We're of Abraham. We're respectable, we're religious, we believe in the God of the Bible. He says, your actions, your speech, how you live, what you do, your motives in your heart, prove that you're a child of the devil. Wasn't Jesus very straight and wasn't John the Baptist very straight? You're going to think by the end of this message, I'm a very mild preacher. You're going to go, man, God's given us a very soft-spoken preacher when we look at these Bible ones. But there's only one family of God. It says in verse 3, and they shall take them Every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. There is a house, a family that gets saved through the blood of Jesus. In the New Testament, the real church is called the household of God or the family of God. In other words, when you find a real church, it's to be like a family. It's to have that feel about it. There should be those who are like mothers and like fathers and like brothers and like sisters. That's what the Bible shows, that the real church is like a household, but it's a household of God. It is a real family. But look here in this verse, in this chapter, it actually shows God has a plan to save all of your children. Do you hear in this church, God doesn't want to just save individuals. He wants to save your entire family. You know, many years ago, I met a family in England. 
called the Harry Lee family. I'm sure you'll guess what sort of background they're from. Harry and Melita, they're a gypsy family. I met real Romany gypsies in England, become precious friends. But you see, I didn't know them before they had met the Lamb of God. And they told me, sitting in their caravan one night many years ago by the riverbank, and they started telling me that he used to come home drunk almost every single night. And his teenage boy, 16, 17 years old, would cheer him on as he began to punch his wife. They lived for crime. They were blasphemers. They were idolaters. They loved their sin. And you know what? They, the boys used to cheer him on beating up his wife. But the Lamb of God came to that home. I mean, Christ stepped into that family. I think they had about 10 children. And all of them got born again. An entire family. And see, sitting in that caravan, Harry Lee was the meekest man you ever met. Do you know God taught him to read the Bible? He couldn't read or write. And he said, God, and now I've got to lead my family. I want this family to know the Lamb of God. I want to teach them the Word of God. Will you teach me the Bible? And alone with God, God taught him how to read. He never went to school, never had a teacher. God taught him how to read the Bible, and he taught his children. You know, when we were there, it was like heaven on earth, a family filled with the glory and the presence of God. You see, if we say that we're followers of Christ, that we are Christians, that we believe in him, that we know him, you better remember that you're following a lamb. What do I mean? The character of a lamb. He's meek. He is humble. Have you ever seen a lamb maul someone? Have you ever read it in the paper? A lamb today attacked a man and ravaged his arm. It's never happened in world history. It cannot happen. You see, a lamb of God is innocent. It is harmless. It is defenseless. There's no pride with a lamb. You cannot provoke a lamb to attack you. It is pure. It's innocent. Look at its color, its manners, its character. You know what? When the lamb of God comes into your family, it'll change your family. Don't say you know Christ, and yet you're proud and arrogant, and you spew out spite to those in your family. You don't know Jesus Christ. You see, you can't say, oh, the blood saves me, but it can act like the devil. No, you can't. No, you can't. Has the Lamb of God come to your home? Do you know the power of Jesus' blood? Has the character of the Lamb come into your home? You see, in the, in the Bible, it says entire families can get saved. Entire families. You can believe God for entire families. If I had 10 children, I'd go, no, one, not one of them's going to hell. I, I, God, help me. I'm not going to let one of them end up a homosexual or a drug addict. I would fight for them tooth and nail. I'd fight for them more than any soldier in the Second World War or the First World War. I tell you, I would be on my knees praying, saying, Lord, send them to heaven. I want them to be in heaven. You know, in the New Testament, many families, entire families believed in Christ. Not just mommy and daddy, the entire family turned to Jesus time after time. But let me finish here. Fourthly, only one alternative. You see, if the Lamb of God, you don't take and choose a lamb for your home, and you don't experience the power of Jesus' blood. We've been singing all about the blood this morning. We've been singing about it because the Bible's filled with it. Do you know what it is to be washed in the blood? Has your conscience been made clean in the blood of the Lamb? Because this is what it talks about. Going to church won't do anything for anyone. And I believe in going to church. It's very, very important. But that won't save you. Has the blood of the Lamb washed your conscience? What's the only one alternative? Only one lamb, only the blood, only one family of God. But lastly, only one alternative. It says in verse 23, for the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, notice God sees the blood. The Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Do you know that night of the Passover? Do you know there was one going to pass over who was going to smite the oldest child in every home? There is a death angel. There is one who is going to pass over called the destroyer. He has no love. He has no mercy. He will smite you with death and he'll visit every single individual. The Bible actually says it is appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. All of us are going to face that death. 
All of us are going to experience the death angel coming over our homes. But do you know what it says here in Exodus 12? It says on that night when the death angel is going to pass over, it says if the Lord sees the blood on that home, that he'll stop the death angel entering the home. Do you know what Exodus 12 actually shows us? That two people are passing through on that night. Two people. There's the destroyer, the death angel, and he's come to kill and steal and destroy. And there's another person called the Lord, and he passes over. And wherever they see the blood, do you know what the Lord does? He stands there in the door and says, not this home, not this person, not this family, not this child. You're not going to touch this child since I want the Lord to stand for me. But is the lamb in your home? Is the blood on the door lintel of your house? Are you the family of God? Are you living for God? Because you know what? This is coming to every single one of us and it's real. It says in the New Testament, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you don't have the Lamb of God in your life, if you're not washed in the blood of the Lamb, the wrath of God abides on you. It, it abode on every one of us. There's people in this room used to be addicted to drugs and used to be into sexual immorality and used to be into new age religion and yet all of us in all of our different ways and yet the Lamb of God came to us I've been changed, I've been changed I've been changed I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb I'm forgiven and you know what I don't, I'm not scared of that death angel of that destroyer let him come to my home you know what my answer is the blood of Jesus Christ it's on the lintel the devil comes whispers in, you're going to die one day. Go look at the door lintel. He says, one day you, I'm going to come knock on your door. I've got the lamb of God in my home. Since I'd hate to be heading into this generation without Jesus Christ as my personal savior, knowing that I've accepted him and knowing that he's in my home and knowing there's power in the blood to forgive sins. Here this morning, we're coming to a baby dedication and these parents, I can tell them, this is a wicked hour when, as I said, little boys are being called little girls. And now we're not allowed to call a he a he and a she a she. I've never heard the like of it in my life. I never would have dreamed it would happen in my generation. And they're actually trying to teach our young primary school kids, you've got to go with this. And if you don't, we will attack you. We will persecute you. This is a dark hour, I want to tell you. But I do have an answer. A wonderful Lord Jesus, he'll keep your mind sane and your heart sane. And he'll keep you walking straight. And you know what? All of us have sinners all of us have, have, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and yet Jesus Christ died on the cross let's stand here together Lord Jesus.